Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jillian Lopez. I am currently a first year DMA student at UCLA. And today we're going to be discussing the harp, its history, music, and the construction of the instrument. So early origins of the harp. In this picture, picture example, the earliest evidence of the harp was found in ancient Egypt in the tomb of Ramesses III, circa 1198 to 1166 BC by Scottish explorer James Bruce in 1768. This depiction was painted on the walls of a side chamber room of the tomb. Harps of this time were shaped like bows or angular and had very few strings. So the earliest origin is approximately almost 3,000 years old. Okay, so as time went on here, the construction of the harp got more complicated. So this is another type of harp called the lyre. And due to trading of goods and various wars along the Silk Road, the harp slowly started to be an integral part of ancient cultures of Greece, Rome, and Asia. Uh, but where this truly originated with this concept of sharing the instrument across, across the world, across the ancient world, um, was this relationship between ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia, which is now modern day Iraq, as you can see here. So this harp is a lyre-like instrument that was found in the Royal Cemetery grounds of Ur, which is now a um, archeological site in the Dakar government in Southern Iraq. So you can see it is on the Southern part of the country here um where those cemetery uh, remains were and where this lyre was found so talking about the silk road a little bit more in depth this is the line of trade through this time period of from the second century bc to the 18th century and you can see here that iraq is is right in the middle of everything and Ur is actually just slightly south of, of the ancient Silk Road route. And you can see the relationship on how close Egypt is to Iraq and Lebanon and Syria. So there was a lot of trade that was happening during this time. And as a result, the instrument of the harp grew and traveled through, through this region of Mesopotamia, which is now modern day Iraq, um, Saudi Arabia, so on and so forth, Iran, Afghanistan, and it went to China, and then it also went to Europe. So it went and traveled a lot of places. So that's why you see a lot of harp-like instruments in China, for instance, like the Gusheng, or in Korea, there's the Kayagum, or Japan, the Koto, for instance. Um, and by proxy in Europe, our European methodology of harps um, for symphony orchestras and so on and so forth. Okay, the non-pedal harp of Western Europe and America. The earliest known drawings of a harp in Europe were found in the region of Reims, France, at a monastery during the ninth century. From the Carolingian Psalter, depicting the biblical story of King David. And there were also a lot of other depictions of harp in these psalms, approximately 100 psalms that were written and depicted uh, at this monastery. So you can see here in this, in this depiction, King David playing a similar looking harp to what we just saw with the Egyptian harps and the lyre. So it's an interesting connection between how Europe adopted the instrument from these ancient cultures. So going on, as 
the harp was traveling through Europe, it hit big in the British Isles. And partly this is to blame due to uh, pillaging and multiple wars with the Vikings. And the Vikings had a lot to do with this, the Northern German influence. Uh, so the harp was adopted into the Irish culture specifically, and also to some extent, the Scottish culture as well. You know, there were a lot of early, as early types of harps were found in those particular regions, more so than England. So Ireland, um, harp is an integral part of the Irish culture. Um, it brought an incredible amount of spiritual and religious practices, either uh, through the Gaelic traditions or through the Christian ones, uh, or the pagan beliefs, rather. Um, so it, it carried a lot of different significance. Um, and it was also regarded highly in a lot of social activities like weddings, again, playing at pubs, bars, playing on the streets. It was just everywhere in the Irish culture. And it just really solidified the harp as, as the nation's musical instrument, so much so that the harp is depicted on their coin. Okay, the first harp uh, to be featured in, in this way is this type of harp that we see here called Brian Baru's harp. This is where the harp got some improvements during the 13th through 15th centuries. Notice here that there is a column now. So instead of it being bow-like, it now has a stronger construction um, due to the fact that there is this column on the side now. So it gives more support, hence more strings. So in this case, uh, it, with Brian Baru's harp, there, were, there is approximately 30 to 36 brass strings or metal strings that you would typically put on these harps. Or sometimes it would also be gut strings. So it, it would be whatever you would have at hand at the time uh, you would be playing it. This harp is also called Clerchec in Irish or Clersach in uh, Scottish Gaelic. Uh, so uh, it has a different terminology other than just harp in this case. So this is what we call an Irish harp or a Celtic harp. It's very similar to the example shown uh, via my Google slide with Brian Baru's harp, but this is a much larger harp, but yet it is still very light and very portable. And this portability is what was important during uh, the 13th through 15th centuries in the British Isles specifically uh, due to bards traveling from town to town. Uh, often they would live in barns um, to get some meals from families or maybe a few tips here and there and they would make songs uh, while they're traveling from town to town just you know to get by and to have a gig um, often you would see these types of harps in pubs social eating places uh, often they would also be street performers so you would see that um, even now and today uh, in Ireland and in the British Isles specifically you'd see a lot of harpists still doing that so that's the beauty of this type of harp is that it's super portable you can take it anywhere uh, some limitations, though, are is the fact that the harp is diatonic. What I mean by diatonic is that it, instead of going to this chromaticism and complexity of pitches and combinations of different pitches, the harp, then this harp specifically, it tends to be in one key at a time. So right now what I have it tuned to is G major. Notice at the top of my harp here, I have these lovers. 
And this is how I can create my chromaticism, is by manually switching up and down these levers. So I'll take my F, which is the black string of the harp. And right now I have it at sharp. And yeah, I'm just gonna switch it up and down so you can hear the difference. So that's the basic gist of it in terms of getting keys. Um, but again, getting that chromaticism is difficult because if you have a really chromatic line, you have to be switching levers at the same time that you're playing the harp, which can be very difficult. It takes a, requires quite a bit of choreography to figure that out. Okay, so after our Gaelic Irish traditions, we're now going to go back to France to some extent and to Bavaria. So during the 17th, 18th centuries, approximately in 1720, the harp had a shift of how it was viewed and also to some extent how it was played. Uh, during this time, composers typically tended to write more chromatic works. So the harp needed to be reinvented in order to keep up with the times, so to speak, um, due to composers writing more complicated works, uh, like CPE Bach, for instance. So in 1720, uh, there was this invention called the Single Action Pedal Harp by Jakub Hochbrücker, and this was invented in Donauworth, Bavaria. Origin the original single action pedal harp had five pedals. So notice on the bottom of the harp that there are these uh, stick things hanging out there. Those are what we call pedals. And this is what shifts our pitches from flat to natural or natural to sharp, depending on how you would tune the instrument. And this gave the harp a uh, leg up in terms of repertoire, uh, playing more complicated tunes, experimenting with chromaticism more, and, and so on and so forth. I'm going to show you another example of how these mechanisms work. So they had a combination of what they called bequi or crochet. Um, the crochet mechanism was the earliest mechanism, and then it went into this Belcri um, mechanism uh, to change the strings. But notice here that our pedals are in an interesting configuration, uh, D, C, B, E, F, G, A, and harpists well, at least most of what I've been taught over the years is did Columbus bring enough food going to America to remember our pedal diagram? But you don't really need to know that. But just know that there are seven pedals. And so eventually the single action went from five pedals to seven pedals, but it took uh, some time to create that extra oomph of chromaticism, if you will. And I'm going to play you an excerpt of one of the, of the first uh, piece for the single action pedal harp by CPE Bach. <laughs> Next in our history here is the chromatic or cross-strung harps. You know, it looks kind of freaky where there's two crossing into each other, isn't it? This unique version of the harp was introduced in the early 1800s by Pleyel, a French inventor. It had two necks, two bodies, and two columns that crossed in the middle, 
each double strung with 40 strings. It was large and physically difficult to play and also very heavy. The first chromatic harp weighed approximately 500 pounds. So it wasn't accessible to move um, and quite cumbersome. Um, and so as a result, it was virtually abandoned by the 1950s and it was such a disaster. Uh, Playel ended up burning the rest of his inventory. So when you're looking for chromatic harps now, there's not very many out there uh, because Playel was so upset about his invention not working because he burned all the harps. Okay, so this leads me to our modern day harp that we use now, uh, the Erard, as you will, and the invention of the modern harp double action pedal harp from 1811 to present. So in this diagram, it looks quite complicated. Um, and it is, it is very complicated. There are over 2000 moving parts to our double action pedal harp. Um, so much so that harpists have to get our harp serviced at least once a year, if not twice a year. I equate it to a car, you know, same thing. Cars are very complicated as well in terms of their mechanics. And it is the same with the harp. You have to oil them up and, and regulate them and, and give them a fine tuning here and there on, on these very complicated mechanisms that you see. So, um, so the plus size to the double action pedal harp is that it allows us to get even more chromaticism than the single action harp because the single action harp, although great, it couldn't go in every single key. So it was very limiting. And as a result, composers uh, wouldn't compose for the harp um during during the romantic era specifically and so it kind of was getting stuck to just solely being a salon instrument instead of being performed in the theaters and with the symphonies uh so so Erard invented this harp in 1810 and or he rather he got the patent at that time uh and um it features the seven petals. And what's interesting too about our pedal system is that we have it engaged by these discs. And I'm gonna show you a brief video of what that exactly does and how the pedals work. Here are the harp discs or mechanisms that you can see here. They're quite lovely. They're these beautifully gold and shiny discs. And what they do is that they turn when I engage the pedal. So we're going to take this red string as a good example. Red is a C for the harp. And we're going to, when I engage the pedal, you can see that it moves to natural, and there's the sharp position, and then moving it back to flat. And so what this does is that when I'm plucking the string, um, oh, here we go. So watching the disc, so a C flat, C natural, C sharp.
Okay, so this gets to gets me to the harps of the 21st century. So it's the electric harp. So notice these two examples here. Um, and what's really neat about these electric harp models is that they have completely transformed how we listen to harp today. Uh, due to having pickups, which are little mics on each string, uh, from there, we're able to synthesize the harp sound and plug it into either a pedal board system or a computer program system. And we can manipulate the sounds however we want. We can add distortion, we could add delay, we can um, alter pitches, we can do pretty much anything. The, the sky is the limit with these, with these uh, particular harps. And it's really, really quite fascinating. With the electric harp, you can see inside here, this is my soundboard where all the sound comes from acoustically. And in here, you can see the pickups are hooked up to each string. And then by proxy, there's this plate or an electronic board that sends information um, to my computer system to create sounds. And from here, We have this, which hooks up to what we call XLR, XLR cables. And from this, that's when you can transform all the sounds you need. And this is my setup right now that I have going um, to experiment with that. And thank you for listening to my presentation. If you have any questions about the harp, feel free to email me and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. And thank you again.